Well, it is indeed an honor and pleasure to be back here at, uh, at Southeastern. I, uh, I look forward to I had a great time the first time I came. Uh, it was cold then now that I think about it. It was really cold. We were going through a cold snap. And uh, so anyway, it's good to be back. I'll, I'm going to try if I can come back next time to bring some warm weather. Uh, but anyway, yeah, uh, African American Missions Heritage. It's a story that has been underreported. And um, to back up what Dr. Strickland said, um, you know, when I went to seminary, I, uh, I took four courses in church history, all three-hour courses that was required. And I put all those four courses together. And you know how much time we spent talking about the black church? Maybe 15 minutes. And I, I, I thought, my goodness, you know, what, what's wrong with this picture here, you know? And I wanted to know about other church histories, too, like the history of the Korean church and all that, uh, you know. So I, I took it upon myself to begin to look at some of those things. And I found a fascinating story and uh, discovered some really amazing facts. So let's get into our, our subject here. Um, the, in the African-American experience, there developed during the antebellum period Two distinct theologies. By the way, all theology is contextual. Okay? All of it. And I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying it's contextual. Even the creeds. You know, the Nicene Creed. Why did it come? Because there was this controversy about the nature of Christ and all that. <clears throat> you know, homo usius versus homo usius and all that kind of thing. So, uh, there developed two theologies. One... In the South, there developed a theology of suffering, okay? And you can go to, now, you're not going to find a 12-volume tome on, on Southern African American theology, but all you got to do is listen to the oral tradition, and you hear it, you know. Uh, you know what I mean by the oral tradition, you know, those of you who are from the, okay, let's see if some of y'all know the oral tradition. Imagine somebody's giving a testimony in a traditional black church, and they stand up, and they say, first, who is? <laughs> yeah, y'all know the oral tradition. <laughs> anyway, so you hear this in the oral tradition. And in the South, there was, uh, of course, slavery was king and all that. There was this theology of suffering, and it was couched in the Exodus paradigm. Go down, Moses, way down in Egypt's land. Tell old Pharaoh to let my people go. Um, and... In the North, in the antebellum North, there developed a theology of empowerment, okay? Because you see, in the North, the issue was marginalization, not slavery, because slavery had died in the North. And it dealt with cultural core concerns of uh, dignity, identity, and significance. Uh, one of the great questions uh, on the significance piece was the, the question, why are we here? Why are we here? And uh, they began to look into the scriptures to see if anybody else was in that situation, in a, you know, in a country, not of their choosing, and to see what God did with them. So they looked at Joseph. They said, huh, that's interesting, right? They looked at Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah in Babylon. They said, hmm, that's kind of interesting, right? They looked at Esther as she, she came into the palace of the king, and she thought, as I shared, as I shared with uh, as I shared earlier, that uh, she thought she was there to pass for Persian. <laughs> but her uncle said, no, 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 there's something else going on here. Anyway, uh, and so in, in, in all three of those cases, their presence in those places, not of their choosing, uh, had global, divine and global significance. So our forefathers said, then our, us being here must have divine and global significance. And they concluded that we are here so that we might carry the gospel of Jesus Christ to the rest of the African diaspora and beyond. Remember I said it was a theology uh, couched in the exilic paradigm. So the whole idea of the diaspora was there. And out of that came an incredible missions movement. Now major contributing factors to the African American missions movement was this view of divine significance. And here was a man here uh, Samuel Hopkins, who was very instrumental in the, the formation of a lot of thinking of African Americans. 
1802, he received his Doctor of Divinity from Yale Divinity School. And he went from, now at one time Hopkins was a slaveholder, but he went from that to being uh, a, a, an ardent advocate denouncing slavery. He was one of the first uh, congregational ministers to do so, and, and others followed his, his, uh, his, his lead. And he developed, uh, actually, um, he contributed to the development of New England, what they called New England theology. Or another name for that was consistent Calvinism. And it incorporated the Westminster Confession of Faith and the Canons of Dort. And he gave greater emphasis to the ethical implications of theology. Now, you see, I have this concept. I talk about, when I talk about theology, I say there's theology, and then there's the A side of theology, which are the epistemological implications, what we should know about God. And then there are the, there's the B side, the ethical implications, how we should obey God. And if we're going to understand African-American theology, historic African-American theology, it, was, it had a greater emphasis on the, the B side. If you're going to understand historic Western theology, it had a greater emphasis, emphasis on the A side. You've got to have both, actually. You know, you, or, or, you know, so. But on the other hand, you know, when you look at the Bible itself, um, well, you know, the A side would be propositions, the B side would be narratives, you know. Um, when you look at the Bible itself, uh, the Bible seems to be more oriented towards the B side. However, I thank the Western brothers and sisters who developed the A side, okay? I love the A side. I, I get off on that, you know. <laughs> and I, I love knowing the difference between the ontological trinity and the economic trinity. You know, you know what I'm saying? I love that stuff. But anyway, um, so he contributed to this uh, New England theology. And uh, so the ethical implications of, of theology, such as compassion, benevolence, and, and, uh, and, uh, and, um, and, uh, and liberty. Uh, I, I got ahead of myself on my, on my slides here, but here's the, here's the A side. Let me, let, me, let me show you. If we think of theology, let's imagine that the scope of theology covers the whole screen. I mean the scope of the Bible, the scope of biblical truth. It covers all of life. Well, the, the scope of theology is much more limited to that than that, okay? It has a smaller frame. And, and here's your A side, okay? There it is. Yours, there's your epistemological. There's your ethical, all right? There's overlapping. And, of course, the other side of A side and B side, the dominant culture in the society tends to go more with the A side. The subdominant culture tends to go more with the B side. Uh, I was just in uh, San Antonio yesterday, and I was explaining to a convention of the uh, uh, Evangelical Free Church, the reason that the Evangelical Church in America missed the Civil Rights Movement, and the, which was driven by theology, by the way, B-sided, they missed the, the Civil Rights Movement was because they were too stuck on the A-side. So, so there it is. Uh, and notice there's an overlap. See, there's an overlapping thing, so this, they're not totally separate. But uh, this theology was the uh, uh, major influence in the Second Great Awakening, and you know a lot of African Americans came to Christ because of that. And during this period, um, uh, this uh, ethical, this B-sided theology became uh, very prominent in the, uh, uh, throughout the congregational churches in the North. In 1773, Hopkins founded a school in Rhode Island to train blacks for missions. And this school had a major influence on the thinking of black missionaries. Now, Hopkins talked about something called disinterested benevolence. And basically, it goes something like this. A willingness to surrender self-interest or even, uh, even be damned uh, for God's glory. Now, disinterested uh, benevolence, then, how did it apply to missions? It applied this way, to be willing to suffer pain and misery in order to save another from suffering pain and misery. Or assisting the nations to come to the knowledge of the truth is to contribute to the alleviation of human suffering. And to promote world missions then was a sign of holiness. The second factor uh, in this whole movement was the concept of kinship compassion. And you see this even throughout the Bible. It was a special kinship relationship that many northern African Americans felt uh, 
towards people of African descent, uh, whether they be in the South or in Africa or South America or whatever. And, um, and so out of this came, emerged what, what, what some call a, an, an, uh, an African-American immigrationalist method of missions between the 1840s and the 1850s. And uh, so what was happening here in this missions movement, people were encouraged to immigrate to Africa, to immigrate to South America, whatever, just, just to go. And so whole, we, we'll see later that whole congregations uh, did this. Now, there were uh, African and Caribbean missionaries uh, who emerged before 1800, uh, especially on the Gold Coast of Africa, um, where uh, uh, Ghana is today, you know. And a man uh, in 1739, a man named Christian Proton, Christian, Proton, Christian Jacob Proton, went to the Gold Coast of Africa as a part of the Moravian missions movement. Uh, Pr uh, Proton was from St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands. And in 1765, he went to, to, Cape, uh, uh, to, to Cape, uh, the Cape Coast of Africa to begin a school. Now, he teamed up with a man named Philip Kwakwe, I think I pronounced that right. Uh, and uh, he was from the Cape Coast. And he was the first African to be ordained a minister in the Church of England. And the school continued under Kwakwe's leadership. And the graduates of this school became known as the Bible Band. The Bible Band. And they were quite sound and quite thoroughly trained in the scriptures. Uh, they gained a great reputation for really knowing what they were talking about. In 1838, Thomas Birch Freeman uh, arrived on the, on the African Gold Coast. Freeman was a British Wesleyan minister, minister, missionary, and he became a major influence in Methodism in northern, in uh, West uh, Africa for 50 years. Freeman met and teamed up with a man named William de Graff. I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Where was, where, 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 where was I? Oh, okay. Well, I didn't get that. William de Graff, he was from the Cape Coast, and he was a member of the Bible Band. And de Graff and Freeman then organized Bible Bands, and they went throughout uh, the continent of Africa. Now, uh, in uh, 1863, John Bryan Small visited the, the, the Gold Coast and was very impressed with the Methodist Church and what they were doing there. And, uh, and he then uh, uh, became a bishop of the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church in Africa and the West Indies. So you, you see already then uh, African American denominations having outreach. Um, all right, now, um, all this activity predated, predated William Carey. All right. Now let's talk about African American missionaries from 1780 to 1900. And here you saw his picture already. This man, George Lyle, is America's first missionary. He's not America's first black missionary. He is America's first missionary. Other people give credit to someone else, but he was actually America's first missionary. Let's look at some background facts about him. First of all, he was the first African American uh, uh, to be ordained as a Baptist minister. And he was a major player in the founding of independent African American churches during the late 18th century. Now, if you understand the history of, of the black church, um, in the early days, in the earliest days, of the black church, it, the church was invisible. Uh, it was a church that met in secret because it was a church that was persecuted quite a lot, you know. My wife's doing some fascinating study right now on the persecuted church and she's showing how the African American church fits into that, into that whole picture. And then uh, in the early days, uh, uh, you know, the, eventually there emerged um, uh, un an underground church, like I said, th then there emerged a, a what I would call uh, a phase called uh, the, 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 uh, the plantation phase of the black church. Uh, 
where African Americans were allowed to have congregations in the open, but they had to be under white leadership, white supervision. And then, of course, the third phase then becomes the indigenous phase, where, where you had a, this revolutionary idea, African American churches on a, under African American leadership. Whoa. That starts with Richard Allen and Absalom Jones and all those guys. But um, uh, uh, Lyle, um, he was instrumental in, in starting a lot of uh, uh, churches in, in his area. Now, Lyle was born in 1750 in Virginia, and around 1772 he moved with his master, Henry Sharp, to Burke County, South Carolina. And Sharp, this is amazing, Sharp taught Lyle and most of his slaves to read and write. Now, you know, this was in direct violation of the Negro Act of 1740 that forbade slaves from reading and writing in English. But Sharp decided to, do, to, to, uh, to oppose this. So it's kind of interesting that here you have a master who is kind of working against the system in a sense. <clears throat> he baptized, he was baptized the following year in 1774. And he was encouraged to preach to the slaves in neighboring plantations. And between 1773 and 1775, he established a Silver Bluff Church located uh, on the South Carolina bank of the Savannah River near Augusta, Georgia. Now, in 1783, Lyle became the, un by that time, he became the undisputed leader of African-American Christians in, in, the, in, in all of Georgia. And that year, Henry Sharp, freed Lyle to carry on his ministry full-time. But a few weeks later, after his emancipation, Henry Sharp died. And Sharp's children planned to re-enslave Lyle and had him imprisoned to that end. Lyle, for how, I, I'm not sure how he got out, but he was eventually released from prison and he immediately made Arrangements to immigrate to Jamaica. <laughs> okay. Um, but before his departure, though, Lyle baptized a man named Andrew Bryan, and Bryan founded the African Baptist Church in Savannah, Georgia, which is the oldest existing African-American church in the U.S. Some of you have probably seen, uh, I, I was down there, took some pictures. It's still, it's still there. Lyle's missionary journey to America then predated Judson's missionary journeys to India by 29 years. And when Lyle arrived in Jamaica, he was deeply moved by the deplorable spiritual condition of the enslaved Jamaicans. And as a result, he began to preach the gospel at the various racetracks around. And as a black ex-slave itinerant preacher, he was a novelty, you know. Uh, and therefore, he, con he attracted considerable attention. News about his preaching spread, wi spread widely. And people said that his preaching style was very much similar to that of George Whitfield. Uh, in 1784, he organized the Baptist Church and experienced, trem and experienced tremendous growth. And in less than eight years, Lyle himself had baptized 500 people. Um, Lyle was also instrumental in planting hundreds of churches throughout the Caribbean. I, I, a number of years ago, I was down in Barbados, and I was delivering a lecture about the Islamic challenge in the Caribbean. And uh, people from all over the Caribbean were there. And, uh, I, and as a matter of fact, at that time, this is several, many years ago, um, I, was, I, I always used to wonder, whatever happened to Lyle, you know? <laughs> he was doing all this, and all of a sudden he disappeared. And so I happened to mention George Lyle, and the whole room erupted. Oh, we know him, we know him. We know. And it turned out, oh, okay, people all over the Caribbean knew about him because of his activities and church planting and, and missions work. In 1789, though, he experienced persecution from the colonial officials because his preaching emphasized side B, the ethical implications of theology. And that pose an economic threat to the system of slavery. And he was even imprisoned for a time and charged with sedition. All right. In the 19th century, um, uh, African-Americans, uh, missionaries, began to uh, be, 
people of African, you know, African Americans began to get interested again in going to, back to Africa. And one of the places where uh, a lot of activity happened was in the uh, in Sierra Leone. All right, Sierra Leone, and uh, and Liberia. Now, uh, one of the prominent figures in this uh, phase of the movement uh, was a man named Paul Cuffey. In uh, in, 19, in 1810. He sailed for Sierra Leone and explored the possibility of trans, transferring missionaries in community. He was one of these leaders who said it's good to, you know, take whole, transplant whole churches over. Uh, he was a black Quaker who owned his own shipping vessel with an all African American crew. And he had suggested Sierra, Sierra Leone as a missions field in 1788. Between 1806 and 1816, 16,000 freed slaves arrived in Sierra Leone. And, um, uh, uh, and many of these, not all, but many of these had been recruited as missionaries by Paul Cuffey and a man named Samuel Mills. So as I said before, whole congregations led by their pastors immigrated over. Uh, men like uh, Cato Perkins and William Ashe, uh, they were both sea captains and pastors. And Samuel Mills uh, and Ebenezer Burgess, uh, Burgess went as missionaries to Liberia. And of course, Mills died in Liberia soon thereafter. But as late as 1878, you still had African Americans sailing for Africa, whole congregations. And, uh, and in this way, uh, thousands of churches were established in, uh, in Africa during the 1800s. Now, this strategy they used was very similar to the strategy used by the Moravians and the Anabaptists. In 1890, then, hundreds of churches, like I said, were established. And the denominations represented over there were, uh, they included uh, the National Baptist Convention, the AME Church, the AME Church, and the AME Zion Church. And several recognized leaders and theologians uh, developed uh, what I call a transnational black community. And, uh, and, they spoke, and these leaders spoke with authority, and they traveled freely between the United States, Canada, uh, Western Africa, and the West Indies. And these included several northern antebellum African American theologians. And uh, most of them were either Presbyterian or they were Baptist who subscribed to the Philadelphia Confen Con Confession of Faith of 1742. So let's talk about some of these leaders in the transnational black community. Uh, Henry Highland Garnett, some of y'all might know him. Uh, in 1843, as early as 1843, as a matter of fact, if I was to ask you the question, who said, who first said that we want freedom in this society right now by any means necessary? Who would you think about? Malcolm X, of course. Malcolm X. Oh, yeah, there's this. I'm, I'm getting behind on my thing, so just let me catch up. Malcolm X. But Henry Highland Garnett said that 120 years before Malcolm X said it. And Henry Highland, Highland Garnett was a born-again Presbyterian minister. And what he did he challenged the slaves to reject their state of slavery. He said that <laughs> the, the, divine, the divine commandment we are supposed to obey, and if we disobey, we will come under judgment. He says, you as slaves are not supposed to be slaves. You've been called to freedom. And uh, it was a very interesting thing. I think if I remember right, he said this in his address to the National Convention of Colored Citizens in 1843, Henry, Henry Highland Garnett. All right, another uh, prominent figure here in this leadership was a man named Nathaniel Paul. And he was pastor of the African Baptist Society in Albany, New York. And he expressed his views in 1827. Uh, and the movement, check this out, the movement that he was advocating was known as, anybody want to guess? Pan-Africanism. <laughs> See, what people don't realize is that Pan-Africanism was originally a Christian concept. 
It was a, it was a term applied to African Americans seeking to, to develop kinship and relationship between people of African descent. And he said this, this is what he argued. He said the regeneration of Africa was dependent on biblical teaching. Because you know Africa had been, Western Africa especially, had been plundered and destroyed by the slave trade. Now, of course there was an Eastern African slave trade too, by the way, which was far more br brutal. Uh, it was an Islamic uh, slave trade. I'm not excusing American slavery, by the way. <laughs> But, um, but, but he said that African Americans had a, quote, special duty to participate in this regeneration. And the day would come when the sons and daughters of Africa would go back to the land of their fathers and spread the gospel of Christ. All right. Here's a couple of guys that worked together. Uh, uh, James Theodore Holly and Martin Robinson Delaney. They argued this. They said, the rape of Africa and the enslavement of African peoples could be ended if a strong black nation could be established in Africa or the Caribbean. The strong black nation could use its economic, diplomatic, and military powers to rescue African and African peoples from the destructive aims and policies of other nations. And so the general aim here was the, was the uh, uplift and progress of Africa based on what the Bible teaches. Uh, James William Charles Pennington, uh, we just got a book about him just not too long ago, it's a really thick book. In 1841, he led a major effort to coordinate Pan-African missions on a national scale. And he argued this, he said that uh, African Americans had a, quote, special obligation to become involved in missions, in African missions. And he was aware, interestingly, he was aware that there was a, a something of a Christian presence uh, uh, out of Europe in Africa that was kind of working in conjunction with some of the colonial activity, but he wanted nothing to do with that. He was totally anti-colonial, and he refused to just to, to deal with any of that. But he said, though, he recognized, like Frederick Douglass recognized, that there's a vast gulf between the, what he called the Christianity of this land and the Christianity of Christ. All right. Uh, Reverend A.W. Hanson, Hanson uh, he, um, he said this, quote, the destiny of, of, the, of, uh, of, of American Negroes is ultimately connected with the regeneration of Africa, close quote. Uh, Reverend Augustus Washington, uh, he said, for too long Africans had been preyed on by the ruthless hands of European and American avarice and oppression. In the providence of God, it was then imperative that we promote the uplift of Africa through evangelism. And the elevation of the African American community was intimately con con connected with the future prosperity of Africa. Um, okay, I've gotten, again, too far. What did I do? Oh, I didn't put Lewis, I, Lewis Whitson. I forgot to put his picture in. Um, he said this, that the majority of the world's population were dark-skinned people, and African Americans had a special charge to go out and take the word of God to Africa. All right, here we come to Alexander Crummel. Here we go. All right. Y'all know Alexander Crummel? Name familiar? All right. All uh, right. He emerged in the, in, the, in the late 1850s. He was the first president of the American Negro Academy. And he, I guess he's best known for being the mentor of W.E.B. Du Bois. Matter of fact, people think uh, that Du Bois is the one who came up with the whole idea of the talented 10th. That was Crummel's idea. He got that from Crummel. He emphasized the need for economic development in Africa. Now, I want you to notice this. They're talking missions here, but they're also talking, about, talking economic development. You, you see, what we're looking at here is that there was this kind of, this theology of empowerment. You got this? This kind of B-sided thing. And uh, uh, so economic development, the need for Africa's descendants around the world to develop economic ties with the motherland. Um, and he basically argued this. He said that strong economic ties would lead to the development of African-American commercial power, both on the continent and wherever Africans live. 
and the prosperity could be assured if the natural resources of Africa were properly developed. Now, this gets some of these guys into trouble later on, and we'll see how it, how it happened. But he said, if Africa and her transplanted descendants could gain control of that development, uh, there would be incredible uh, potential for uh, 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 progress, and et cetera, et cetera. Now, he said, the God-given mission of the American Negro was to rescue Africa from ruin, to empower oppressed people of African descent, and, quote, to destroy the power of the devil in his strongholds by ushering in light, knowledge, hope, and Christian faith. Crummel, again, was aware of the presence of Islam in America. He was aware of the fact that uh, Islamic Arabs had enslaved Africans and sold them into slavery in the Muslim world. And he was aware that Arabized African tribes had sold their fellow Africans into American slavery. So he wasn't uh, naive like a whole lot of African Americans in the 20th century thinking that Islam was the panacea, you know, uh, but it wasn't. That, that's for my Islamic lecture, which I won't get into at this point. <laughs> okay. And Crummel pointed to the AME church as proof that African Americans were up to the task because he pointed out that they had established home missions, they had founded a college, and they saw them as a model for what African Americans could do because he said, hey, look, the AME church has already established the 14th and 15th Episcopal districts in, uh, in Western and Southern Africa. I'll never forget this. In, in 91, I went to Africa for the first time. I went to South Africa. And I was blown away when I saw AME churches there. It was amazing. Now, so putting all that together, the African American missions thrust in Africa was, was armed with what they called the three C's, the three C's, all right? Christianity, commerce, and civilization. Now, nobody is perfect here. That third C, turned out to be problematic in places like Liberia. Because that third C, civilization, was after the order of what they understood civilization to be, which was Western civilization. You got it? So what happened in Liberia in the, the second generation that came over, matter of fact, my wife um, is, uh, she is a descendant of, uh, of the first president of Liberia, a man named Roberts. You know, I, I didn't know that I had married royalty. <laughs> 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 so as a matter of fact, it's funny. We, we, were, we had a, a Liberian at our house the other day for dinner. She said, do I look familiar? Because if you see her and you see a picture of uh, President Roberts, th there's a strong resemblance. She said, yeah, you do look familiar. I can't, can't place you. <laughs> so he, she says, you know who Roberts is? He said, oh, yeah. And he, he had some, uh, some uh, Liberian money. He pulled it out, and there was his picture right there. He said, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so what happened in the second generation, uh, there began to be a, a cultural uh, a rift going on between the, the, the American Liberians and the natives. And, uh, and you know the history of Liberia since then. Um, but uh, anyway, yet... These were efforts trying, you know, they were trying to, trying to do something here. Now, uh, the African mission scene between 1850 and 1900, uh, first of all, we talk about Nigeria. Uh, there was a lot of activity. Now, check this out. From 1860 to 1872, 1,237 Brazilians and Cubans together with 1,533 Sierra Leoneans migrated to Lagos, Nigeria. That was a huge migration. And this was encouraged by black pastors and missionaries who had gone to Nigeria from Sierra Leone. So a lot of these people were some of these people that I mentioned, uh, part of this transnational black community. And their goal was to expand Christianity in Central Africa. In 1875, um, uh, again, this transnational black community, some of these guys that I mentioned, 
were well established. And uh, now this is an interesting thing. If you study the history of uh, of, uh, of, of 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 American missions, you will remember some names like the African Inland Mission. Remember that, or the Sudan Interior Mission. Why is it inland? Why is it interior? <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. See, by the time they got there, the black missionaries had the coastal areas all sewed up. <laughs> and so they, they, they couldn't, you know, they, they, was, they couldn't get a, you know, they had no place to fit. So they said, well, let's go to the interior. But the problem was they needed somebody to give them entree. And guess who gave them entree? It was the black missionaries who had the coastal areas because they understood the culture and then they gave these European and American missionaries entree in the interior. That's interesting, isn't it? Um, they could not have succeeded without the help of the black missionaries giving them entree. Now, here's, a, here's, a, here's an interesting figure in the history of missions. Samuel Crother. Um, uh, he, um, uh, he and many of his followers uh, dominated the A Anglican Church in West Africa prior to 1875. Now, Crother was a Nigerian by birth, but he was an Anglican bishop out of the Niger Valley. Now, all these things were happening, all this activity, and most of um, the, the, the African-American and Afro-Caribbean missionaries in Africa were pretty much... Um, oriented towards this theology of empowerment. But that posed a problem with the colonial uh, administrations. Now watch this. Things were okay at first because the colonialists were kind of laid back and they were just trying to do their thing and the missionaries were doing their thing. But the thing that changed the whole picture was the consolidation of colonialism, European colonialism in sub-Saharan Africa. Now what led to this? First, the Industrial Revolution in Europe happened. And with the Industrial Revolution came the increased need for raw materials. And the raw materials in Europe were quickly exhausted. And so they needed to get raw materials from somewhere else. Another thing that contributed to this was the development of the ocean-going steamship. Now before the sailing ships, they couldn't sail unless the winds were right and et cetera, et cetera. But with the steamship, you can do it like clockwork, all right? The next contributing factor was the opening of the Suez Canal in 1869. Next, the building of railroads in many of the colonies, which made getting into the interior very easy. And then because of that, colonial activity dramatically intensified in sub-Saharan Africa. And when the colonial activity intensified, then guess what? The colonial powers began to dispute among themselves. It was a bad scene. They, they disputed among themselves about uh, access to the resources. So the British were fighting the French, were fighting the Dutch, were fighting the Germans, were, et cetera. It was, it was a bad scene. So in 1884 and 85, German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck calls a meeting called the Conference of Berlin. And, in there, in, and at that conference, the colonial powers came together and drew the dividing lines between their various areas of jurisdictions. Now, this is something that's amazing here. Not one African was present at that meeting. And so these boundaries and borders that were drawn did not take into consideration the people groupings or the tribes or anything else like that. And I think one of the problems that we have in Africa today are artificial borders. The borders are just not right, you know, because they split some tribes and they lump some into stronger tribes, et cetera, et cetera. It was a bad scene. And so that's where they, they, they drew those. Um, so you had British East Africa, you had the Belgian Congo, you had, you know, on and on and on. Now, once they were able to do that, to stop fighting among themselves, then they can concentrate on getting down to business by doing co colonialism. But guess what? The anti-colonial stance of the African-American and Afro-Caribbean missionaries uh, 
was a, an obstacle to the commercial interests of the colonial powers. So now, at first they were kind of laid back, but now all of a sudden they're serious about this, and now they got a problem. What are they going to do with all these missionaries who are teaching some other things? So tensions develop between black missionaries uh, and, uh, and, and the colonialists, especially between black missionaries and their white-dominated missions, uh, mainline churches. For you know, like for uh, some missionaries are over there at the, you know, as part of uh, they were sent there by uh, white uh, mainline denominations. Now, for example, leaders like T. B. Freeman. Uh, chose to identify more with the indigenous people than with his mission society. Because by that time, his mission society was becoming very paternalistic. And the, and the indigenous people began to complain. And he said, no, no, this is not right. You know, So he began to side with them. And eventually, this led to a rift between themselves and the societies that sent them. Uh, some, African, some of the actions taken by the colonial administrations and these mainline churches uh, many black missionaries were marginalized. Uh, they were uh, undermined and discredited. Uh, sometimes they had their names stricken from the record. Uh, some were dis dis just tossed aside in their old age. And this is in spite of their powerful preaching and ministry of the Word of God. And during these years, the established mission boards then decided, because of things like this that were happening, to discontinue trying to work with indigenous leadership. They were not going to allow indigenous people to have anything to do with leadership in churches in their own countries, and they discontinued to work with black, mission, black leadership. Uh, the indigenous people uh, and, 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 and African Americans and Afro-Caribbeans were now judged to be, quote, not adequate for the job. And therefore, during this period, the work of earlier missionaries was discredited, particularly in the development of ind the indigenous church. Examples of this was Bishop Crother was forced to resign in his old age, and T.B. Freeman was swept aside. Uh, some black missionaries came under persecution, uh, kind of like George Lyle did, you know. Um, uh, the colonial governments imprisoned a number of black missionaries, particularly in the Belgian Congo, Rhodesia, and South Africa. Uh, one example that stands out here is, uh, is Kenneth Shepard. He gave 18 years of service to the Congo Free State, but in the end, he spent his last eight months in the Belgian prison for supporting uh, the complaints of the uh, Congolese, Congolese um, Christians, because, you know, because of the paternalism. Because uh, this embarrassed the Southern Presbyterian Church, his name was stricken from the records. However, Ken Shepard was still regarded as a significant hero among African Americans uh, and leaders of the transnational black community. As a matter of fact, uh, you see mention of him in the writings of Booker T. Washington and others, that he was still considered a hero among uh, African Americans. But all black missionaries, whether they be African American or, or uh, Afro-Caribbean, were eventually expelled from the colonies. Between, um, between um, watch this, between 1853 and 1880, the Methodist Church sent 33 African Americans to serve in the field, okay? No white missionaries were sent to Liberia by the Methodist Church during these years. <coughs> But that's 1853. But 1880, the Methodists suddenly sent 50 white couples to settle West Africa and Central Africa. Why? Because the other missionaries had been booted out. So the colonial administrations not only did this, but then they denied entry to new black missionaries, whether they were from Africa, elsewhere in Africa, America, or the Caribbean. An absolute ban. No black missionaries whatsoever. They saw the presence of black missionaries as incompatible with the economic interests of the colonial governments. And in, by 1926, the colonial governments had informed all mission agencies that African Americans were no longer acceptable. Now, to their credit, a lot of these mission boards tried to fight this, and they resisted it. But in the end, they ended up giving in. 
and thus it became the official policy of mission agencies to reject all black missionary candidates. In West Africa, uh, uh, the continued presence of, of the colonial governments eventually resulted in a rift between mainline churches and a number of the independent African churches. This is when you begin to see African churches breaking away because they, you know, they came under this tremendous domination from, uh, from Europe and they began to break away and form their own churches. In 1890 through 1920, many African mainline churches broke away from their, their, their denominations and this breakaway movement was called Ethiopianization. Ethiopianization. And it was aided and influenced by the transnational black community because they had a strong anti-colonial stance. Now, the, resist, the issue of resisting um, uh, white domination became so intense. Now watch this. It became so intense that the gospel itself became lost in the sauce. Okay. And as a result, uh, the result was, one of the results was the secularization of what was left of the black missionary movement. Uh, because you see, you know, if, I shared yesterday in San Antonio, I said, you know, we talk about preaching the gospel. Everybody says the, the gospel is the answer to all the human uh, issues and stuff like that. I said, well, wait a minute. If that's the case, then why don't we see these solutions happening or why haven't we seen these solutions happening in the body of Christ in America? And I'm not talking about those liberals. I'm talking about these Bible-believing folk. Does that make sense? So therefore, there's two possibilities. Either the gospel is not what we think it is. It is not the power of God unto salvation. Or the gospel we think is the gospel is not the gospel that you see in the Bible. I think I like the, I like, I like the second option. <laughs> so... So what began to happen then, this, 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 this uh, dispute and all of this oppression and resistance and everything got so tied up and that the gospel was kind of put into a box, people said, ah, oh, the heck with that. And, um, and so um, this trauma then decimated the extensive African-American missions movement in Africa. I mean, it, it happened within 25 years. Between 1875 and 1900, all of this happened. And so as a result, missions became associated with trauma in the black church. And you know, whenever you have a traumatic experience, I remember uh, a few years ago, somebody tried to kill me uh, on the highway. I mean, he rammed me, just boom, you know, and I, I, I hit the, he almost timed it right, I hit the, that divider in the middle, and bounced all the way back across the interstate and almost went off a cliff. It was, it was close. But it took me three days to remember that. It was so traumatic. And I think that's what happened to the church. Oh, by the way, uh, uh, it was because of my activity with leading Muslims to Christ. People, some people didn't like that. Um, so if you want to do that kind of ministry, just, just take a note. <laughs> Watch out for cars trying to rock, ram you. <laughs> Uh, so as a result of this, the African-American church slid into what I call missions amnesia and, uh, or missions involvement coma. So the black church just shut down. It, just, it was so traumatic. Uh, now, there was a reawakening of interest in missions uh, in, among African Americans uh, in the 1930s. Now, I'm, I'm not going to mention all of them, but I'm just going to mention just a couple. And this happened with the emergence of black evangelicalism in the 1930s. Um, however, black participation in missions was still blocked, okay? Because the existing mission boards continued to refuse African American candidates. And the general justification for this practice was this. African Americans would, you know, African American would-be applicants were told this. Quote, and I've heard this from actual people who have done this. Quote, you would not be accepted by the indigenous people, especially Africans. Okay? So therefore, don't go. Uh, 
because you're not going to be accepted. But the Africans who asked why African Americans were absent were told, quote, African Americans have no interest in missions, especially in Africa. I've, I've actually heard scores of people on both sides tell me this is what they heard. All right. And in response, black evangelical mission boards were established in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. Now, you've got to understand, black evangelicalism, that's a whole other story, how black evangelicalism came about. But it came about because of a, a couple of things. Um, some... Um, some uh, uh, Caribbean missionaries to America decided to reach out to African Americans, and they, and they, and they, they paid a high price for that. And then, uh, then they established churches, and one thing led to another. And that, that's, how, that's one of the major factors in the development of black evangelicalism. But in response, some of these African American missions, because you see, the, uh, the black evangelical church came under the tutelage of their white counterparts. And their white counterparts had, were doing missions and having missions conferences. And they said, let's do that too. But they hit that brick wall. They said, well, what are we going to do? So they began to form some small missions boards. Like in, uh, in 1947, the Afro-American Missionary Crusade was founded. In 1955, the Carver International Missions was started. And uh, in 1965, Half Christ will travel. <laughs> Missions was founded. <laughs> and uh, these were small missions boards, but they were really trying to, you know, trying to counteract the, you know, they were trying to do an end run around the discrimination they experienced. Since then, uh, we've slowly seen the, Af the African American church come out of its missions coma, missions involvement coma. There's been more and more interest in it, and uh, as people begin to rediscover, uh, this dimension of mission. So, uh, anyway, that's a little bit about the uh, African American missions heritage, and uh, uh, I hope this has been informative. Uh, but uh, it's 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 an encouraging story in some ways, but it's saddening in in other ways, you know. And I'm hoping sometime in the future, uh, uh, it's 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 amazing that. And I tell folks this all the time, especially African Americans. I'm, I'm, I say, I get this in email, I get this in Facebook, uh, and there's people all over the world who want to hear our story. It's an amazing thing. I, there was a time when I was constantly being bombarded by Ira uh, Iranians who had become Christians, and they, they wanted, they said, please come, please come, please come, um, and uh, other places like that. Um, uh, a group of us went to Australia this summer, and uh, we, uh, we went there specifically to talk to the aboriginals. And it was amazing to find that how much, in some ways, they identify with us, even though their story is different. I mean, their story would be more like First Nations, you know, than African Americans. But yet and still, you see them walking around with... Uh, Jordan T-shirts on and all that, all that kind of stuff, you know, and uh, but they they do identify, and uh, so I guess what I'm trying to say is that God is a God who redeems a whole lot. He redeems everything when we give it to Him, and in a very real sense, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, you know that passage in in. Um, Matthew 24, where Jesus says, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world, and then the end will come. I wouldn't be surprised, given the, the global interest in African Americans out there. I mean, they listen to our music and all that. I mean, you go to Tasmania, and they can tell you who Tupac is. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, uh, it just might be, and I, I don't know, don't, don't, I'm not speaking ex cathedra here, but I, but I think it just might be that African Americans might be a key to that happening. Uh, and, and it's true. Mission boards these days are saying, hey, we want more African Americans. You know, they seem to be, seem to be uh, a clamoring for that. So anyway, I'll just throw that out there. Who knows? Uh, I think um, God has brought us to such a time as this to be instrumented of, of his glory. So, Doc.